I'm Eric Rosales. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, Mission of Peace. A Vatican official returns from his two-day trip to Russia. We'll have a report from Rome. Parents' rights. A closer look at pro-life measures being considered on Capitol Hill. Speaking out. What some Catholic schools are saying about the end of affirmative action in college admissions. And inspired by faith. We continue our conversation with Eduardo Verasigui, producer of the new film on the fight against human trafficking. These stories and much more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you so much for being with us on the Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle. I'm Eric Rosales, in for Tracy Sable. Our top story tonight, the Vatican envoy trying to bring an end to the war in Ukraine is back in Rome. Cardinal Matteo Zuppi spent two days in Moscow late last week. There he met with faith and government leaders. Cardinal Zuppi previously helped broker peace deals to end the conflicts in both Africa and Central America. EWTN Vatican Bureau journalist Alexei Gutovsky has more. Cardinal Zuppi started his two-day trip to Russia last Wednesday with a prayer at the Tretiakov Museum's chapel in front of the image of Our Lady of Vladimir, which is greatly venerated in Russia and Ukraine. He then met with Russian government officials and had a notable meeting with Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. The trip concluded with the uh, Cardinal celebrating Mass at the Catholic Cathedral in Moscow and meeting with local Catholics and clergy. One bishop from Siberia told me that it was important for him to travel almost a thousand miles to support the Cardinal in this difficult mission, showing that the bishops are not indifferent when it comes to car caring for peace. Cardinal Zuppi said yesterday in, a, in an interview with Italian state the television that the focus of the trip was on addressing pressuring humanitarian issues. While the Cardinal did not have a meeting with President Vladimir Putin, he did meet with Yuri Ushakov, the advisor for a foreign policy, and then the Cardinal held a significant meeting with Maria Lvova Belova, the Russian Commissioner for Children's Rights. Last year, the International Criminal Court accused Vova Belova of being responsible for the illegal transportation of approximately 19,000 Ukrainian children to Russia and their adoption by Russian families. However, Lvova Belova denies these allegations. Following her meeting with Cardinal Zupi, Lvova Belova published in her Telegram channel expressing her confidence that Christian love and mercy will contribute to dialogue and mutual understanding. The meeting between Cardinal Zuppi and Patriarch Kirill was arranged at the last minute, but was significant. During the welcome, uh, the Cardinal mentioned that Pope Francis emphasized his desire for the meeting to take place, place leading the Cardinal to make changes in his schedule accordingly. Patriarch Kirill emphasized the significance of dialogue and recalled that during the Cold War, there was ongoing discussions between the Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches. Cardinal Zuppi, in turn, expressed the need for dialogue to deepen understanding of God's will in these challenging times, uh, particularly when the conflict in the Cardinal's words became hot. Cardinal Zuppi soon will meet with Pope Francis to provide an update on his experiences in Kyiv and in Moscow. Based on their discussion, further steps will be determined. Additionally, there has been a change in the Russian diplomatic course at the Vatican, and the new ambassador, Ivan Soltanovsky, is yet to present his credentials to the Pope. In Rome, Alexei Gotovsky, EWT News, Nightly. Pope Francis has appointed a longtime friend, Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez, to lead the dicastery for the doctrine of faith. The Holy Father has asked the Archbishop to dedicate his personal commitment to guarding the faith, which is the main purpose of the dicastery. The Archbishop has been a personal theologian and to the Pope and ghostwriter on several major writings. He's also been a figure of controversy for some of his own works. A group that tracks how the church deals with allegations of clergy, clergy sexual abuse says Pope Francis has made a, quote, troubling choice in appointing Archbishop Fernandez. BishopAccountability.org says that the 2019, the Archbishop refused to believe victims who accused the priest of sexually abusing boys in his archdiocese located in La Plata, Argentina. 
A judge in Texas has dismissed a lawsuit brought by a Carmelite monastery against the head of the Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. Bishop Michael Olson was accused of theft and abuse of power. This after he launched an investigation into the alleged affair between a religious sister at the monastery and a priest. The judge dismissed the case without comment. Well, a year after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, abortion remains a hot topic on Capitol Hill. Democrats continue to push for abortion on demand, including for minors. Republican Congresswoman Mary Miller of Illinois tells EWTN News Nightly that she wants parents to be informed, so she's introduced the Parental Notification and Intervention Act. What it's going to do is that providers when they have a young girl, a minor, that is seeking an abortion, they have to notify the parents and give them four days, allow them four days to intervene, or they will face civil penalties also. The CDC reports that there were almost 147,000 births to mothers age 15 to 19 in 2021, with an abortion rate of 17 percent. Democrats on Capitol Hill continue to demand unlimited abortion access at any time and for any reason. Again, there is no shame in having had an abortion. There is no shame in seeking an abortion. The only shame is those that are fighting relentlessly to deny you that which is a human right. Congresswoman Miller tells me she's also sponsoring a bill requiring that the remains of aborted babies be treated with dignity. We need to honor that that child was created in God's image and dignify the child by having the remains of the child um, disposed of in the same way that we would any child that died. She also says abortion doctors would face fines and possible prosecution for not following the bill's requirements. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops backs the bill, saying in a statement, quote, these human bodies should not be wantingly discarded as medical waste or preserved at the whim of the abortion doctor. Such basic courtesy is in keeping with society's treatment of all other deceased persons. We can at least come together to ensure all human remains are treated with basic human dignity. Republican Senator Mike Braun of Indiana is co-sponsoring both measures. While the bills will probably pass the U.S. House, they won't likely be brought up in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris uses social media to defend abortion. She describes it as, quote, the freedom to make decisions about your body. The Biden administration also continues to criticize Friday's Supreme Court decision that protected a web designer's free speech and religious liberties. Sending these kinds of things to the courts and sending these kinds of things to state legislatures for the clear purpose of chipping away at the equality and the rights that have so recently been won in the LGBTQ plus community. But former President Donald Trump defends the U.S. Supreme Court, including its decision to block President Biden's student loan forgiveness program. The former president says that it would not be fair to all the people who've already paid back their loans. He also supports the high court's decision to end affirmative action at universities. Those justices ruled to move our country forward with a merit-based system of education. How big is that? Isn't that big? Isn't that great? Former President Donald Trump spoke Saturday in South Carolina. It was the first rally since being indicted on federal charges. A prominent Catholic education group and several Catholic colleges and universities are blasting the U.S. Supreme Court's decision late last week to overturn affirmative action in higher education. The Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities called the decision, quote, more than disappointing, adding that it, quote, ignores the more than apparent effects of continued racism in our society. The Catholic University of America and Georgetown University also spoke out against the ruling. The University of Notre Dame released a more measured response, saying that it will study the ruling before moving forward. Well, we now go to Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the upcoming journal at the Common Sense Society. Chris, welcome back as always. And we have a lot to discuss, but first I want to get your take on the Catholic school's reaction to the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling. What do you think about this? Well, I don't think it's very surprising to see that from many of these schools. Uh, uh, these are generally speaking elite universities. A number of them, including Georgetown, have traded in a lot of their actual Catholic bona fides in exchange for that kind of respect 
And these institutes are seriously captured by groups that really do, activist groups that really do think that the only way to address inequality or problems in our society and humanity is to have different kinds of racial quotas and things like that. Now, if I were them, I actually wouldn't be too worried about this because, well, the affirmative action case is has, has, has been struck down, colleges are still able to have a holistic view of what they're going to let in. And right. I see a lot of these right. universities going around this ruling and still making decisions based on race or gender or politics and just calling that approach holistic. We've already seen places outside of maybe MIT getting rid of SAT scores, getting rid of uh, different kinds of testing and other sta more standardized measures and relying on this. And well, I expect that to continue. Well, let's talk about the other issue. The nation's highest court on Friday also ruled against the Biden administration and its plan for student debt forgiveness. Help us unpack this. How does this uh, possibly hurt the president politically? Well, the president suffered in the first round for his first election, especially mm -hmm. during the primaries, and has since in getting enthusiasm from some of the younger, more left-wing voters and, and, and youth voters Democrats have been able to rely on in recent years. He's doesn't speak to a lot of the same issues that they really care about, but student loans is a way to get them energized. They did this in time for the midterms, and it was a fully calculated political decision. The president said openly that he knew he couldn't really push for more, and he already was probably exceeding his authority with doing this. The Supreme Court said that they he, he did indeed do that. So now it's up to them to try and figure out a, a more constitutional way to try and do this. One of the different methods that they're trying to work on and test out right now is making it income tested. So maybe if you make less than $33,000 a year, for example, you have to pay $0 in student loans until you start to make more. That sort of thing might be more palatable to the Supreme Court and then would end up helping them again with these young voters. Switching gears now, we've heard from former President Trump praising the high court's decision this weekend. He held a rally out there in South Carolina that drew a massive crowd. Are there any other Republican candidates gr gaining traction in this race, uh, the Republican nomination race? No, not that we've seen so far. There's places, folks that have gained traction with the donors, for example, uh, Ron DeSantis, for example, right. and he's got a lot of people in D.C. who are paying attention to him. But the only person from either political party who's able to gather these sorts of festiv festival-like crowds is still absolutely Donald Trump. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything yet. It's still early. Donald Trump has a six-year running advantage on any other GOP candidate, and the debates haven't begun. That's when people really start to pay attention. A lot of those voters out there haven't seen a Donald Trump speech maybe in the last year or two or three years, haven't really kept up with this, but so they still support him. And maybe that'll change. He'll give it an in for different candidates like Ron DeSantis and others uh, after these debates begin. And Chris, talk to us about some of the other stories that you're working on right now. You know, one thing that caught my eye as we entered this Independence Day was a piece in the New York Times about how so many uh, more Americans are just not feeling patriotic, but not willing to celebrate. It started out with an 18-year-old girl being interviewed who said she used to love it as a child, but now she thinks it sounds like gunshots, and she thinks mm. America is a racist country, and also there's so many pollutants and fireworks. And it just strikes me as such a, a joyless and kind of neurotic way to view the world. And people should, the, this country has come a long way. There's a lot of things that still need to be worked on. There's a lot of things that people have worked on, given their lives to, toward and for over the decades to bring us that. So this July 4th, we're not celebrating the perfect country. We're not in heaven yet. We're celebrating a country that tries to do better every single day, every single year, and the sacrifices that those have made before to get us this far. Amen to that. We are a relatively very young country out there. And uh, Christopher Bedford, executive editor of the upcoming journal at the Common Sense Society, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, we still have a lot more to come on EWTN News Nightly, including fight for Catholic schools. Two parents in Maine describe their battle for school choice. Plus, we continue our conversation with Eduardo Veraccini to talk about his faith and how it played a major role in his new movie. Welcome back. A Catholic family and a Catholic high school have filed a lawsuit in the state of Maine. They are challenging the exclusion of faith-based schools from the tuition assistance program. Keith and Valerie Radonis uh, are joining the St. Dominic Academy to help ensure that all families have the option of sending their children to the right school. And we're now joined with uh, Valerie and Keith Radonis. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you both for being with us. Uh, first of all, Valerie, 
Tell us why you want to send your children to St. Dominic's and how did the state of Maine respond? Um, we, we would like to send our children to St. Dominic's because it's it's a good um, good education um, and it's it's rooted in our faith. And um, I'm, <laughs> what, was, <laughs> what was the second part of the question, please? <laughs> oh yeah, just how did the state of Maine respond? The state of Maine responded um, well, as as we know that they um, have responded by by blocking uh, religious mm. families, religious schools from town tuitioning. Keith, tell us more about your community and what schooling options are out there for your children. Sure, uh, we live in a rural town in Maine, uh, and frankly, there aren't many options available for high schools in and around uh, our town. Uh, that's why Maine has this town tuitioning program for rural communities uh, and where our tax dollars would have paid for a public education uh, in a high school in our town, since there isn't one, we're afforded the right to use that, uh, the, that tax dollars uh, are essentially refunded back to us to send our children to a school of our choosing anywhere in the state or anywhere in the world for that matter. Now, was it a very difficult decision to file the lawsuit to take up such a high profile case? It, it took a lot of prayer uh, and mm -hmm. thought, um, but we felt that God put us in, in a position where he was asking us to do something, uh, not just for, for us and for our our children, uh, but for, for the diocese and for the faith at large and for, for religious liberty here in America. Yeah, that kind of goes on to my next question of how important do you think it is the outcome of determining this rights for parents uh, to be able to decide where their kids go for their education? I think it's monumental. Uh, you, you know, we, we don't want anything different than any other family here in, in the state of Maine. We just want the opportunities that they're afforded. And we feel like we're being brushed aside because of our religious views. Um, so, you know, it doesn't matter if, if you're a Catholic family or a Jewish family or a Muslim family. This is about treating all families that are faith-based equally uh, as, as with the rest of the people in the state of Maine. And Valerie, can you give us a quick update on where the case is at and where it stands today? Um, as far as I know, we are, um, we are due to have, um, uh, some time in front of the, the court in July or August, um, for questioning and, uh, I don't know the proper term for that. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be a, I think a, a, a appearance before the court here, uh, either in July or August, uh, mm -hmm. with the Beckert firm, um, and they can, you know, probably give some more insight onto uh, exactly where we are in the legal process. Right. And talk to us, what, what both would you want us as Catholics to do for you? I mean, prayer? Prayer. Ab absolutely. Uh, you know, prayer is, is, is critical here. Uh, and I think that, you know, prayer to, to open the hearts of, of those who are making laws like this that, that, are, that are really oppressing those with, with religious views. I think, uh, you know, prayer and, and support for, uh, you know, Catholic families and, and, and for the Beckett Fund. Um, you know, they're doing great work here for religious uh, liberty uh, for, for folks throughout the country. Well, our hearts and prayers go out to you both, and uh, may you continue on this journey. We appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank you very much. Valerie and Keith Radonis, uh, Catholic parents who filed a lawsuit against the tuition assistance program in the state of Maine. Thank you so much for being with us. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, Modern Day Prophets, Pope Francis calls on the faithful to direct others to Christ. We'll explain. Plus, part two with our interview with a Catholic actor in his fight against human trafficking. Pope Francis calls on every baptized person to be a modern day prophet. Profeta, fratelli e sorelle, e ciascuno di noi. During his Sunday Angelus address, the Holy Father emphasized that a prophet is a living sign who points others to God and not a magician who can tell the future. Well, last week we heard from an actor and producer on his new film about the fight against human trafficking. In part two of our interview with Eduardo Vegasigi, our own Tracy Sable takes us deeper into his Catholic faith. She began by asking him about his recent meeting with Pope Francis. Well, you know, I, um, I've been blessed to go to Rome often, uh, one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, as you know, um, I grew up Catholic. My faith was not the center of my life. 
my first 28 years, not because I didn't want to, but because I didn't know my faith well. How can you, how can you love what you don't know? But something happened in Los Angeles, California, when I met a wonderful lady and and, and many other friends who, who, because of them, I opened my eyes and I realized that uh, that in one hand I thought I, ha I thought I had everything, but in the other, in the other hand I had nothing. It was very empty and something was missing, and it was my faith. It was God. Uh, because yes, it was part of my life, but it was not the center of my life. I started going to Rome every year. Um, I met Pope Francis the first year when he was elected Pope, and I told him about this project, and he said, I promise I will be praying for, for you and for this project. And every single, every year that I see him, I, I was telling him, well, the project is almost there, almost there, almost there, almost there, and finally it's finished. Uh, I met with him. Uh, last year, I met with him this year, April 21st, um, and it's, it's been amazing having um, someone like Pope Francis praying for this project and many other cardinals and bishops and priests around the world praying for this project. Yeah, praise be to God. That is wonderful. Um, before I let you go, Eduardo, I, I know that you have your hands in a lot of things and also in politics as well as the head of CPAC Mexico. I'm curious, what made you want to get involved politically and where do you see yourself in the future? Um, politics for me was, um, you know, it was not important. It was far away. Uh, I always thought, you know, politics divides. Um, there's a lot of corruption there. So I didn't want to, I didn't care about politics. I didn't understand politics. So I thought I want to be involved in art uh, because art has the potential to bring people together and unite people. Politics divides people. So I want to dedicate my entire life to use art my interviews, conferences, everything has to be directed to save lives. Because being pro-life doesn't mean only to defend the most important fundamental right, which is the right to life. Yes, that's the most important one. But we don't, we don't stop there. We, sometimes we're being false accused that, ah, oh, these guys pro-lifers, they only care about the babies in the womb, but after they're born, they don't care about them. It's not true. Being for life means to be taking care of these kids who are living in the streets, homeless, teenagers who are suffering from addiction. We need to be there too. The laws of abortion started, you know, coming into Mexico. And for some reason, I couldn't move back to America and I stayed in Mexico. And I started doing the same thing that I was doing in the United States, meeting right, you know, uh, politicians that are pro-life, pro -life, so I can join with them and again, art, politics, ethics to serve the nation. But eventually I got just tired to see how my country is being abused for decades and decades and decades. And uh, a Catholic country governed by anti-Catholic government. And I realized that, you know what? Enough is enough. And if I don't see any good option out there that is going to protect human life, I'm an outsider, I'm not a politician, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, I'm an actor, I love my vocation, I love what I do, but I wanna get more involved, not just working alone, but more involved, and I wanna invite everyone to get more involved because you cannot ignore um, you know, politics. Uh, there's no empty chairs, there's no empty chairs in, 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 in um, in politics. Yeah. Eduardo, it so Eduardo, it sounds like you're talking like a politician possibly running for president of Mexico at one point. I'm not talking as a politician. I'm talking as a Catholic um, person who cares about people. And I, some day, one day I asked Pope Francis, you know, and many people ask him, uh, should Catholics should be involved in politics? For sure. He said, but everything is very dirty inside. Well, it's dirty inside because good Catholics are afraid to be inside. So he was actually doing, uh, making this call to action to everyone to be involved in politics. Now, you can be involved in politics in, di in different ways, right? So I've been praying about it. I'm thinking about it. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, I have to make a decision very soon because I get a lot of invitations um, to run. And But I feel like, you know what, my vocation is this. I, um, I have never done anything in politics other than work along with politicians. But there is a lot of, you know, uh, people asking me, so I'm praying about it. I'm discerning. Um, I have to make a, you know, 
I have to decide very, very soon. Pray for me. Uh, you will know what the answer is very soon. And thank you so much for everything that you do and for this movie. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes out on July 4th. Everybody go out and see it. Eduardo, thank you again, and God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your prayers. And just a reminder, as Tracy mentioned, The Sound of Freedom opens in theaters tomorrow. Want to thank you so much for watching tonight. Remember, you can still follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Eric Rosales. Have a good night. Have a safe 4th of July, and God bless.